This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. On this show, we get into the crowdfunding campaigns out there that are currently raising money, what it is they're doing right, how they're getting traffic, advice that they have for you, uh, maybe some of the stuff you're not seeing behind the scenes. I try to share all of that with you on this podcast, as well as to kind of inspire you just a little bit, man. (laughs) Just just a little bit. I want to share some inspiration in your life. um, So you can also see people that are just like you that are raising money on with crowdfunding though people that um, don't necessarily have a huge budget maybe people who have their projects blow up like i want you to see that this is something that is a hundred percent possible for you to do as long as you have the right strategy um, you're using the right techniques you have the right people around you you can have a successful crowdfunding campaign and that is the goal of my show is to show that for you so basically i started this podcast in 2015 i also have a blog crowdcrux.com i have a, a youtube channel as well and um I also have a book out there called The Kickstarter Launch Formula, which you can find on Amazon. My goal here is to sort of demystify this for you. So before we get into today's interview, where I actually interviewed a individual, a company that has launched 10 projects on Kickstarter, their most recent project, uh, the Lomogon, this has actually raised over $300,000 on Kickstarter, almost at $400,000. And this is for the Lomography uh, company. So uh, in the past, I also had on the individual I spoke to today, which is uh, Birgit uh, Burchart. And, and she basically runs the marketing there for, at Lomography and they raised over $280,000 for their last project. And this was in episode number 217 of the podcast. So it's been a little bit of time since we last talked and she sort of came on to share some more thoughts that she had that she learned in the interim about crowdfunding and about how to actually have a, a smash success when it comes to Kickstarter. Before we get to that interview, I wanted to share with you a link where you can get started learning about crowdfunding right now, step by step. Um, If you've been kind of like searching around with my different podcasts, this kind of is more of a step-by-step free course that I put together for you. And the link for that course is crowdcrux.com slash crowdfunding. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash crowdfunding, a great place to start. And the second place that the second link I'd love to share with you before we get started is actually the link to my audiobook for the Kickstarter launch formula. The audiobook I put together, I, I, I read the book with pizzazz and with enthusiasm, with energy, and like not those boring school teachers you might have had when you were growing up. Um, and I read this for you, and it's really in-depth. It's, it's super comprehensive when it comes to launching a project. I think you would like it if you're in the beginning stages and also you want to learn more about things like shipping. You want to learn more about marketing. You want to learn more about how to get traffic to your campaign. Um, and the link for that is crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash Kickstarter audio. Go and check that out on Audible. Um, If you sign up for a free 30-day trial, you can also get a copy of that book. I love Audible. Those guys are doing some great work. And also, if you like podcasting, you'll probably also like audiobooks, I think. They have a pretty good, I think, crossover there. But without further ado, let's get into today's project. Let's learn how this new campaign um, has raised so much money on Kickstarter, almost at $400,000 at the time we are recording this. It's coming up in just a second. 
Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. We have Lomography back on the podcast here today. They've done a few different uh, episodes with us with their last project that we had on. This was episode 217, and they had raised a little over $280,000 for their project. They are back on Kickstarter. They are killing it. They're at over uh, 394,000 raised from more than 1,000 backers with their latest project. We're going to let Birgit uh, tell you a little bit about in just a second. Um, well, great. Welcome to the show. Uh, congratulations on all your success. This is your 10th project that you've launched here. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your project? Yeah. Um, thank you for having us, first of all. Um, we, are, we are really excited about this um, 10th Kickstarter project. Um, this one is very important for us because it basically combines the two worlds that we've um, had so far. Um, we've done a lot of um, instant cameras in the past, and then the other world is the art lens um, world, which is going into a little bit more into the professional photography world. And this one um, combines those two a little bit because it's going to be an art lens for SLR and DSLR cameras. But it will produce the characteristics of the Lomo LCA camera, which is one of which is basically the camera that started our whole company. Mm-hmm. Um, it is uh, it was developed together with uh, the Russian camera manufacturer Zenit, and it is a 32 um, millimeter camera for, as I said, analog and digital cameras, SLR cameras, um, and it is perfect for travelers, for street photographers, because of the um, wider focal length um, and it therefore encourages to be spontaneous go out shoot the street and journeys that you're on and mm. yeah and that's sort of like that's in line also with your brand I mean sort of bringing back I think some of these like old school look and feel kind of photography to the the modern day photographer and also kind of giving them new tools and new ways to perceive the world and sort of capture that on on their camera right yeah that's another point why um this one fits so well into this little niche that we've um as you said, it's we we've, with all our products, we encourage people to just don't think and shoot, basically. And for the art lenses, um, it was in the past more focused on portrait photography. This one really is super compact and handy to go out and be spontaneous um, when shooting it. It seems like your community has really rallied around this project, too. And also, I mean, all of the project that you guys have launched, you've really become, I think, a household name here on Kickstarter. I mean, with 10, 10 projects you've created over the years. Yeah, um, we are really um, happy that we found Kickstarter as such a great um, platform for us. It's just a, the perfect match for what we do, um, because... Despite what most people think or might think, um, Lomography isn't a huge company, first of all, um, with massive fans from different invest- investors. It's more uh, like small family run organization, um, but with a worldwide network uh, and amazing community. And Kickstarter is, is, is exactly that. Um, it's a perfect match because it, it provides a platform to interact with the community during the product development process. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've worked with Kicks, with the guys from Kickstarter um, closely and they've been helping us a lot. And that's really amazing. You know, we've talked a little bit in some of their other interviews about the marketing behind the campaign. With this interview, I kind of want to start off asking you about the actual product development cycle because I know that you have, you know, prototypes that you have before you actually unveil this to the public. You probably have testing that you go through. Can you give the listeners a little bit of insight in terms of what happens before you unveil this, like the, the, all the testing that you go through here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, with this particular lens, we actually um, did a very, very long um, test runs, basically. Um, We had extensive tests all around the world with different photographers. We wanted to give it to a variety of um, photographers who shoot different styles, who use different gear and everything. And we really allowed us to have the time to um, collect a lot of material, first of all, to share with the community beforehand, but also to really... Um, gain experience with the lens and test it um, as much as we can, um, which turned out to be a great um, thing to do to allow yourself the time to test it Mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. Um, 
I yeah. would say I would say also there like on that point I'm a very like rigid thinker to I think my detriment <laughs> and like when when I was starting with business you almost like want to have everything be perfect like you have this business plan you execute on the plan and like you put all of the blocks together and then you get this this ending goal or you solve the problem but it seems like you're a little bit more flexible when it comes with your product product development cycle you know, maybe the the ideas you have in the beginning they might mold and change as the product right. is going through this cycle can you talk a little bit about that yeah yeah um well you kind of we try to be as flexible as possible um which is of course one of the advantages on kickstarter if you allow yourself to be flexible and to even though you have a prototype still um consider changing stuff about it um you can actually react to the wishes the concerns um the feedback from the community um to give you an example we uh because of our extensive tests um we were like, comfortable that everything was in place and then we when we launched on kickstarter a lot of people were concerned about um dust entering the the lens through the aperture wheel that it has and they were like you know asking us a lot about that aspect or like isn't that dangerous for dust to enter the lens and we because we've tested it for such a long period of time all over the world, we didn't really, they, they didn't even think about mentioning that aspect because we just did not experience um, that being an issue. But then, of course, that's uh, that's a concern that people have. So we added the option to unscrew the rear part of the lens, for example, to for people to clean the lens themselves, which is some something we did not have planned originally, but we added um during the campaign in order to make sure you know <laughs> yeah, they yeah. can clean it and like stuff like that like little things or for example a lot of people were re requesting um pentex mounts we only like launched nikon and canon beforehand um and we thought okay let's see if uh, people are hoping for sony or pentex or whatever and then we saw pentex being um at, like people asking for a Pentex mount. So we added mm -hmm. that um, as an update to the campaign. And these are just things that um, if you allow yourself to stay flexible, it's really nice to react to those requests from your community. Of course. When it comes to the, the product before you go live on Kickstarter, are you sending out like surveys to get people's thoughts on what they want to see next? Or are you unveiling any early stuff on social media and getting feedback? Like, is there any feedback in the before Kickstarter phase? Uh, before Kickstarter, we don't really reach out to the broad community, but we do have our photographers and testers that we work with and who we, of course, ask for their feedback. And throughout the years these um, testers have grown and grown so now we have like a really big circle of um, photographers we work with and yeah they definitely get test the lens test the first prototypes give us the feedback and i see um, yeah. Um, another thing that kind of resonated with me in terms of some of the ideas that you sent over um, before we scheduled the the interview was uh, I always think of like fitting everything into the campaign page and like giving people as much information as possible in order to make mm -hmm. that like backer decision. But you guys seem like you come with a different perspective, almost wanting to use updates to kind of fill people in. Can you, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, that's a little bit of a new thing that, thing that we're trying out. Um, you naturally, first of all, you want to fit all the information into the first uh, campaign page, for sure. And we used to do that. We did that a lot. Our pages were super, super long. Um, I sat down this time with the guys from Kickstarter before we launched, and we went through the page, and they pointed out um, things that are not necessarily um, on the first, don't have to be on the first um, page and can be followed up with in the updates. And it turned out there's a lot of stuff where, first of all, people just want to know the general information on the first glance, but it shouldn't look too complicated, too much to read through. And, you know, mm. so most of our, a lot of our content, especially like sample photos and videos we've had, we um, decided this time to um, send out through the updates instead of squeezing everything into this first page. And it looks way more cleaner this time and way more. Um, yeah. What is your what is your relationship been like with the team at Kickstarter? Did you guys reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? Have you been working with them like from the early days? Would love to hear a bit about that. Um, 
I so this for me personally, this is only the second Kickstarter that I've done with mammography. So I'm pretty sure they've been helping us um, since the first project. Uh, they are normally really close with their um, um, customers, basically um, with the developers. And if they're there for you, you always get some uh, in contact or two to you can reach out to you. And depending how much you engage with them, they will get back to you. Um, what other kind of yeah. insights did they did they give you? So the one being, um, you don't necessarily need a super long page that we see sometimes on Kickstarter that you can leave a little bit for your imagination and have updates and like you know mm -hmm. use these to explain. Were there any other tips that Kickstarter itself gave you? Um, one thing that they told me that I wasn't aware is, for example, the importance of the first day um, for the campaign which really sets the tone for the rest of the campaign. So you want to make sure that on the first day, um, ideally within the first eight hours, um, you get as much coverage in like press and social media and stuff as possible because um, that first day is crucial. And um, before that meeting with Kickstarter, I wasn't aware of the importance of that, for example. So but they really help you a lot, even like also with the designs aspect of the page and uh, new features that they might have introduced and stuff like that. Let me ask you a bit of a dumb question here. Um, <laughs> why is the first day important? Good question. <laughs> um, I think they just uh, told us that th from their experience, they've noticed that um, the more buzz around the project the first day, the better it ends up in the long run. And the, the first day is always the strongest by far. And um, I don't really know what, <laughs> why mm -hmm. that is but um it's just something that they found very important and from in, in their, their statistics in, yeah. yeah their experience i i think it has to do with like the fact that it's something new you know quite frankly um right. and also that like on that day i mean you raised a good bulk of funding on the first day like you were past the 100k mark um, and yeah. even the first few days, like you just probably started to trend better on Kickstarter and such. Like your first three days were really strong. Um, so I think it has to do with urgency a bit. Also, like something new is being announced. It's kind of like a ripe opportunity to announce it probably to the, the press, wouldn't you say? Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, we also, because of um, that importance of the first day, we made sure that um, we informed the press ahead of time a little bit earlier than previously and made sure that they had all the information that they have time to prepare stuff and um, also our testers to make sure that they post about it and yeah. I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at The Gadget Flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far, and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. When it came to that, like the, the press outreach, um, were you just like emailing people that had covered other projects? Did you send them any prototypes or anything or like, what, was, what did that look like? Um, this time we, well, we sent out the press release, um, to all our press that we work with to, you know, whoever we think might be interested. Um, we also offered them because we don't have that many prototypes for all the press who's interested. Um, we this time um, told them that we have prototypes available at the office in different locations or different locations throughout uh, the country and, and world basically. And that everyone who's interested in getting their hands on a prototype can come by, schedule a, a meeting and test it out in their own time. So, and then that kind of like kindled a bit of the fact that people can then write about you. Cause like right. since you, you haven't yet launched, you know, it's still a bit, a bit of a question mark, I think, in, in a journalist's mind. It, exactly. Especially with Kickstarter projects, a lot of press is, in general, hesitant to cover it um, before it's even funded. Because, you know, they obviously also have made the experience of covering um, launches on Kickstarter and then the product wasn't funded. So they are a little bit careful with those um, announcements. But it definitely helps if they get a chance to check out the product um, themselves, IRL. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, totally. I mean, also those like high resolution images, like all the assets you have. Um, I think the press, I mean, they're in the business of having to get traffic and to make something interesting for their readers. So like if you don't have cool photos or you don't have an interesting story, obviously their readers aren't going to be interested in that. Yeah. So like they have to satisfy their readers, you know? Yeah. Um, I think also when it, when it comes to, you know, launching a project, I actually never even thought of this, but you know, one of the things that you kind of, I guess, brought to my forefront of my mind is this idea of testers and like the more testers that you have on social media or the more people that are, um, looking at the prototypes you have, the more traffic you get, um, yeah. and being more a bit transparent about that, that early stage process, it actually leads to more people backing you. Yeah, for sure. Um, it is also, um, people just see that it's not only, you know, um, employees who've tested, uh, the, the product or whatever. It's really like independent, um, photographers in our case, um, who, um, had the opportunity to test out a lens for two weeks and they all agreed to share their, uh, results. So it like, you know, people start to trust you more, but also there's more traffic on social media. There's, which is more and more important. Um, and yeah, it's it exciting, all, like, yeah. It is. <laughs> so I, I have a few more questions for you, but um, before mm -hmm. we do, you know, since the last time that we talked, um, how have you been growing here? Like, how have you been, what have you been learning about yourself when it comes to working with Lamography and also the community? What, is, what has it been like for you personally? <laughs> um, personally, hmm, that's a good question. I think um, I'm, I'm just loving more and more the community aspect, um, which is important to Lamography. And as opposed to other companies where it's um, marketing strategies and sticking to the rules of, you know, how to market something and, and having like a template of how to do it. Um, I feel like it's, I love working here in with Lomography with the community community because I feel like I, I get to be way more flexible um, about the marketing aspect. We, um, I am in constant communication with the community, with people who um, reach out to us and and want to learn about it. And I feel like there's no better marketing than just talking to the people who want to buy your product and um, chat with them, nerding out with them about cameras. And that's why it, it's really a lot of fun here. And I think what I've learned is not sticking too much to the rules, um, which is also what Lomography ta taught me about photography. Um, so it makes sense. And just like um, trust your guts about what, um, how, how to market something, but also what people might want. I think it's also just really neat to be able to like see the whole cycle of a product. Like you go from creating this thing to marketing it to then getting feedback on it. You know, I'm just looking through the page here. You have like one quote, um, the wideness of the angle really gives you rich photographic composition with a lot of detail, doesn't deform your image. That's really important. Like you're, you're getting real feedback from real people and yeah, they're then and taking photos with it and like you're actually impacting the world that way. Yeah, that's super exciting. Um, I love the fact that um, the people who uh, work with us, our community, our Kickstarter backers, are not only looking for a fun gadget, but are actually like passionate about the products, passionate about photography, and really give us valuable feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do think you're, one of the great things about your company is your values are very, very strong, I can see. And that almost kind of filters down, I think, into your employees and the people working there and the ethos of the company. And it shows a lot also in the products that you guys are creating. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, there's nothing to add. That's a great point. And I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, that's actually a good hallmark of like any company is you need some kind of a mission and values. It's kind of like your culture almost, the way that you're viewing the world and the way you think that things should be done, maybe with more flexibility, not thinking too much. You're just taking cool photos, doing things that right. you might be a little bit afraid to going on those adventures. Um, so I, I really like that aspect of, of your company. I did have like another technical question here too. So when it comes to your project, um, this is something that's a little bit controversial, I think, is this aspect of stretch goals. Because mm -hmm. I see so many projects with you know stretch goals and then other ones like yours, you're saying that this maybe is too distracting and confusing. Can you kind of like elaborate on that point a bit? Yeah, um, we used to do a lot of stretch goals for past um, products. It also, well, first of all, it's not a, uh, 
a thing of stretch goals are good or bad. It always depends on what product you're launching. For example, with the instant cameras, it's way more easy to um, make stretch goals and to add little, little accessories for a camera. Um, but with the with an art lens, there is you know every stretch goal will be another um, expensive and um, and complicated addition, basically uh, as an accessory for an art lens. Um, but also we've noticed that a lot of times with the stretch goals, it just distracted us way too much from the main product. Um, while we were you know behind the doors working on all the stretch goals on the all the new uh, accessories and stuff. Um, we weren't able to like truly uh, adjust the main product um, as much as we would have wanted to maybe. And this time we thought, let's just focus on this lens and be able to add or change certain things according to the feedback and the stretch goals, which, you know, would be like a, an, a pouch or whatever for, for the lens. We can still, if we find the time still at that in, afterwards or you know but it's not necessarily during the campaign during those crucial 30 days um we're focusing on the main product and i think that was a good call this time yeah so it's almost like For simplifying sure. simplifying the campaign page and yeah. um even the reward aspect i imagine you know making yes. sure that that's easily understandable yes we also um made those a little bit clearer this time um for example um you can now pick the Canon or Nikon mount that you want um, your lens to be after the campaign in the survey instead of making splitting it up into two pledges, um, which sometimes was confusing for people to look at. So we tried to boil it down to the most important um, or, you know, most uh, the essential. general mm -hmm. yeah, um, things and all the other stuff can be... Um, chosen by the backers after the campaign ends in that survey when they send us their address and it just makes it clearer and and easier for people to understand i think we're in a, a kind of like a unique position here in that so you came back you came on the show in episode 217 we're on like 250 around there now um wow. and you were basically you guys had um done a, another product um the diana instant uh square camera and, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was insane, I think, the amount that you guys were doing, the amount you were raising. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of focus in our industry on, like, funding and the amount of money you raise and, like, how cool that is. But um, there's, so, there's, like, a whole host of problems when it comes with having a successful project because then you have to actually fulfill your reward tiers and you have to ship these out to people. Do you mm -hmm. have anything you learned or any words of wisdom on, like, that fulfillment front for, for a campaign? <laughs> well, we are maybe a little bit spoiled because we have uh, teams all around the world um, who help us with that as well. Um, it's, it never, I think you should, you have to understand that it never runs completely smoothly um, for no one. It's there's, there will always be bumps in the road, but um, from, I think our teams were able to estimate the, the, the shipping and, and ETAs pretty um, accurately already from the experience that they've had. And you just have to give yourself enough time to, to make sure that um, you, you, you'd either or you'd rather um, deliver a little bit too early than too late. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But I think that's just experience over the years from our uh, logistics teams. Um, that's not really my focus, so I, I don't think I can say too much about it. But it, somehow they make it work. Mm -hmm. Do you do you also do any of the customer service like during that phase? Yeah, well, during the Kickstarter campaign, um, pretty much everyone <laughs> in all our teams are helping out with the customer service. Um, it's always been one of the most important things to be in constant communication with the backers because you know if they have a question and are on your kickstarter page you want to give them the answer right away so we all like work weekend and night shifts right now to answer all the questions um thankfully um this time it turns out we don't get too many questions which is a good sign for us that we've made the kickstarter uh, website clear enough for people to you know not be confused as much so we definitely can see an improvement there but um yeah totally. we all jump in and when we get the notification we all just uh, try to 
reply as soon as possible of course <laughs> totally totally um well thank you so much for for coming on the show and sharing this also just kind of curious have you been learning about crowdfunding like in the interim like have you been um mainly studying your own project you've been looking at other campaigns like i just wanted to get a sense of how you've been learning about this you know the, the, from the marketing standpoint um i personally have mostly learned from my coworkers and our headquarters at lomography I, of course i scroll through other projects as well and i'm curious um, how they're doing it but most of my knowledge right now is from internal <laughs> communication okay great well we really appreciate you coming on the show and you know sharing some of the things you learned i honestly think that's the only way that we improve like the education in the industry is just kind of getting inside of the head of marketers like yours like you and getting yeah. a sense of like why you do the things you do and your own perspective on how crowdfunding works, you know? Yeah, I appreciate that. I totally agree with that. Glad I could help, hopefully. Where where can people go to learn a bit about your new projects? Um, looks like you have nine days to go at the time we're recording this. Where can they go and check it out? Yeah, um, on the Kickstarter page, um, look for Lomography. You can see previous um, uh, campaigns and the Lomogon art lens is the one that we were talking about. And of course, on lomography.com, you can find also all the information, sample photos and interviews with the testers and everything you need. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to I'm gonna give you the last word here. Um, I'd love it if we could end and you could maybe share a word of encouragement with the listeners who are right now looking to start a project, um, maybe a final tip or a bit of advice or uh, even a word of warning, like anything you'd like to share there. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great if we could end on that note. Yeah, um, well, I would say if you have an idea and you believe in it, um, definitely just do it. But also make sure if you want to do a Kickstarter, um, just um, get in touch with Kickstarter, let, uh, get some help from them, talk to other um, companies who've done that. There's a lot, a lot of details to learn. Um, but try it. It's fun. You know, you, you can never uh, really fail with Kickstarter. Yeah, don't think too much. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, uh, appreciate your, your interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, we'll have to have you back if you have any more new insights from um, some of the campaigns you'll be launching. Yeah, I'd love that. Thank you so much. Let me tell you about our latest sponsor, SendPro Online by Pitney Bowes. Shipping can be complex. Things can get really confusing really fast. With SendPro Online, it's easy to save time and money no matter what you send, from letters and packages to overnights and flats. You can easily compare USPS, UPS, and FedEx in an all-in-one online tool. You can print shipping labels and stamps directly from your printer. You can even track all of your shipments and get email notifications when they've arrived. SendPro Online is only $14.99 a month and listeners can get a free 30-day trial when you visit pb.com slash crowdcrux. That's pb.com slash crowdcrux. Experience the convenience of SendPro Online for yourself when you sign up for a free 30-day trial. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Bergman. Thank you for joining me here and hope you took away some stuff when it comes to putting together an effective campaign page, when it comes to um, connecting with a community that surrounds your project. I hope you took away some lessons there that you can apply to your own project and your own campaign. Um, this is also, this is a learning experience. So you got to check out some of the other podcasts that I got out there that I have with very successful entrepreneurs, people that are raising money every single single day. And in addition, if you want to get access to more of like a step-by-step -step fashion to launch a crowdfunding campaign, go and check out the link crowdcrux.com slash crowdfunding. At that link, I share with you um, some really key videos, some key lessons and strategies and takeaways for getting traffic, for getting media attention, all these different things you got to do if you want to smash it on Kickstarter. So that link is crowdcrux.com slash crowdfunding, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash crowdfunding. Just put that into your browser, enter your name and email, and you'll start getting some some, some emails from me warming you up to these different concepts. In addition, I have an announcement for you today. So I started podcasting in 2015. I started podcasting as a way to sort of get my voice out there to the world and to connect with the community that I was growing on my blog. And when I first started, I sounded horrible. <laughs> I sounded really monotone. 
I still think I sound not so great, but you know, people tell me differently. I, I basically was an introverted kid and uh, I never saw myself as a public speaker. I never saw myself as a podcaster, but lo and behold, over time, I started to learn more. I started to grow. I started to get better at doing things like modulating my voice you know, and getting into understanding volume and confidence and these different things. And in addition, I started to grow my, my traffic to my podcast, started to get more downloads. Now we've done over 100,000 downloads. We've produced more than 250 episodes of the podcast. It's insane. And it's grown so much because such an integral part of my brand that has enabled me to do so many different things. So I decided that I wanted to put together a free course on podcasting. And this kind of goes through some of the lessons that I've learned, some of the um, things that when it comes to the equipment of podcasting, when it comes to microphones, when it comes to how do you sound better? How do you market your show? These different things. If you are at all interested in starting a podcast, in starting your own show, in growing a podcast or monetizing it, I, I want to share share with you this free course because I wish that someone had created this um, when, when I basically was getting started. So this this the link for this is crowdcrux.com slash free podcasting course. That's crowdcrux.com slash free podcasting course. That link will take you to a form where you just enter your name and email pretty much. And um, you can start getting some, some educational content from me on podcasting. I think it's important to always learn from people that you kind of resonate with. So if you like my teaching style, if you like my no nonsense approach, um, how I try to break things down, and also the fact that I don't like to be super fancy about it, you know, just kind of talk one on one to you in a very informal fashion and share with you just the things that I know, the things that are proven and verified, um, you're going to like this when it comes to starting your own podcast. So the link again for that is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash free podcasting course. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you love it. And also hope you like today's episode. I will see you next time.